Recreating History, Examining the Bustle Dress. The process for this research begins with a painting. For this project, the painting is In the Greenhouse by Albert Bartolome. I have long found this painting mesmerizing and thought about how the dress would be built. For those who reconstruct historical costumes for theater, most of the real world research we do begins with a drawing or painting of some form. From this, we must research the historical methods used to craft the garments and then for the purposes of theatrical production, decide whether to disregard, modify, or utilize these historical methods. It is my belief that research into the construction of these historical garments is beneficial to modern makers for theater. It broadens knowledge beyond contemporary garment industry practices and fosters not only deeper understanding of historical technique, but also this research endows makers with the understanding of what goes into creating historical garments. From the understructures outward, there is more work that exists underneath the exterior layers. Here we see the painting In the Greenhouse by Albert Bartolome. For this project, I began by acquiring fabric. In order to have fabric that fit exactly what I wanted, I used the company Spoonflower. There I was able to custom print the stripe and the polka dot fabric to be exactly the same color. As you can see, it took several renditions to get the polka dots exactly right. The first layer constructed was the cage underneath the bustle. To do this, I utilized historical images as my main reference. I then cut sprung steel to lengths that I required and strung them through channels and draping tapes. This was then secured into a layer of fabric to form the base and hold the spines in tension. Over the cage is a simple petticoat and then the skirt. The first question of the skirt was how to get the pleats to lay evenly. Because of the extreme shape of the cage, I decided to drape a yoke at the top of the skirt and then set the pleated panels into it. The process of pleating was time consuming, requiring me to press out the white in the stripe and then secure the individual pleats in place until the skirt could be sewn together. In the skirt, there are 168 pleats across the panels. The polonaise was by far the most interesting portion of this investigation. The front panel is cut entirely in one with no waist seam, and yet the garment is closely fitted. Through research, I discovered that the waist darts are often used in garments cut with no waist seam to allow a closer fit without obstructing the long line of the front panel. It was also apparent that the polonaise was not floor length, so the hem prior to bustling was cut in a long arc. Everything is then pulled back and held in tension using tapes affixed to the interior portions of the polonaise. Here I am showing the finished inside of the polonaise. The tape along the middle holds the garment in tension around the waist, alleviating weight placed upon the bustle cage. In the middle image, the tape used to hold up the bustle stylings are clearly visible. The central tape is strung through rings and attached to a button at the waist, allowing it to be raised or lowered as desired. As stated earlier, sometimes you choose to disregard your research in favor of modern tastes. The research I did shows that in the 1870s, fitted sleeves were most often cut as a balanced two-piece. This allows for greater fitting and shaping. However, to the modern eye, this does not look correct with a stripe. The central image is the finished sleeve, and the final image you can see is the pattern I chose. By choosing a one-piece sleeve with an extreme shaping dart in the lower portion, the line of the sleeve is unbroken down the back creating a long line that is pleasing to the modern eye. Thank you for joining me on this investigation of the bustle dress.